So our final phylum or um, group of phyla rather is the angiosperms. And we have one division in this Magnoliophyta. These are the flowering plants. So everything you see that flowers and many things that you don't see flowering actually do flower, belong in this group. Anything we haven't talked about basically already. Uh, types of these, we have what's called hardwoods. They're typically deciduous. Okay, we learned that back in our first lab of the year with the uh, pineals. There's an evergreen and there's deciduous, meaning they lose their leaves uh, each, each fall. And so uh, these are going to be deciduous. There are a few, very few broadleaf evergreens in this group. Okay, uh, but almost all of your evergreens actually belong in uh, the uh, uh, gymnosperm group. <clears throat> we also have herbaceous plants where these stems are not covered in a bark, not a hardwood, and these would be our grasses and what's considered non-woody dicots. So we do have some uh, dicot plants that have rather stiff stems. They're not monocots like the grasses. They are going to be dicots, dicotylenes. Those are terms that you may not be familiar with, and we will define those when we get to them. An example of each of those. Here is a monocot, a grass, uh, looks like probably a wheat, maybe an oat, and a redbud tree, I believe. We depend a lot on angiosperms. Uh, they provide us food, clothing, medicines, commercial products. Some of the other divisions file I've talked about prior to this uh, provide some of these items as well. But this is where the bulk of our uh, dependence upon plants really comes into play, is right here. Uh, almost, almost all of the plants that we have domesticated for cultivation uh, is, is an angiosperm. Definition of dicotylenes. So here are uh, some bulleted pieces of information. You gotta listen carefully here. This first one is not a distinguishing characteristic. This is just a statement of fact. The stem can be either woody or herbaceous. Okay, you're gonna find that exact same statement on the monocot. So if I'm asking you to list things that you can look at to determine whether you're looking at a dicot or a monocot, dicot being short for that, see, cut it right there, it's dicot, then you're not going to state that first one because it, it's true for either one. Okay, so it's a statement of fact. So starting here, the next four and what I'm going to add in that you don't see on here, okay, is going to be what we're looking at for our distinguishing characters. So the flower parts are in fours or fives. Okay, um, I'll talk about flower parts here in a little bit. Leaves have veins in a net pattern. Vascular bundles are arranged in a circle in the stem, and the vascular bundles are arranged in a star pattern in the root. Okay. When you sprout the seed, you get two little seed leaves coming up, and these seed leaves are actually called cotyledons. That's your scientific term for those seed leaves, one or two, and here we have two. So die means two, two seed leaves. That's the name. Some examples, buttercup, mustard, maple tree, cactus, pea, rose, and the list goes on and on and on because there's just hundreds of these. Monocotyledons. Mostly herbaceous, can be woody. Okay, uh, there's the mostly, always implies there's an exception. Something that uh, is interesting is that uh, the bamboo uh, is a monocot and yet it's got rather woody stems. So, yeah. So, flower parts in threes, leaves have parallel veins vascular bundle is scattered in the stem and going to be in a 
circular shape in this, in the root. You have to add that one in. Okay, so there again, this is only a statement of fact, not a distinguishing characteristic. And here are your four, one, two, three, four, and then the fifth one, or this should be five, okay? Uh, but however you wanna list them. In order, I put the root in here. Vascular bundles are in a circle or a ring pattern in the root, as opposed to the stem. Okay, scattered in stem, ring and root. And you get one little seed leaf coming out when you sprout the seed, okay? So examples, lily palm, oh, palm, there's your tree that's, uh, oh, I may be mis mistaken on that bamboo. I was thinking it is though, I have to look it up now. Uh, maybe I was thinking of a, a bamboo is kind of related to the water reeds uh, that grow native here. And I may have been thinking that that's a monocot, and I'm not sure now, uh, palms, palm trees. Okay, definitely wouldn't call those a herbaceous stemmed plant. Uh, so there definitely is an example if my, my bamboo and water reeds are wrong. Okay, wheat, rice, corn, maize, and other agriculturally important grasses. All right. Unique features of angiosperms, the flowers attract animals for pollination. That's why they're there. That's why usually they're bright and showy and beautiful. It's for that. They prote uh, protect the developing mega gametophyte and they produce seeds enclosed by a fruit. Uh, so flower anatomy, okay, sepals. This is the green outermost structures that form whirl around the petals. I've got a picture coming up here a little bit. Petals, colorful, attract insects. We've got stamen, that's the male parts, composed of filament and anther. And that's where the uh, pollen grains are gonna develop. Uh, usually grouped around the pistil, the pistil is the female part. Here's a, here's a model here. Okay, so I don't know if I wanna annotate, because last time I annotated it didn't let me, let me move on, but I might. So here we go, this is a sepal. Okay, if you can see my cursor there, <clears throat> sepal. It's the green protective part. It looks like a, I don't know, undeveloped petal. But usually it is, it's not, it's its own thing. But it's usually very waxy. Uh, in some plants, it can have a little like thorn on the tip here. And what it does is when this is all closed up, you know, imagine this closing up around all of this stuff before it blooms out and this other one over here on the other side and there's one here and one on the back side there's two actually over here so there's like two here and here all attached all around that is your bud you know how the bud is all nice and green before it blooms and it's usually uh, uh, pretty tough if you've ever tried to pull a bloom open um, those outer what look like petals are sepals so they are uh, really tough and, and they um, are usually a little waxy what that does is that prevents insects from having easy access to the inside of that flower before it blooms, petals and everything. Um, and there's sweet nectar produced down here at the base of the pistil and the um, stamen. So uh, insects like that. And eventually we want the insects coming in, but not before it's time, okay? Kind of like the, oh wow, it's a really old commercial if I date myself. I say that I'll date myself for sure. <laughs> the really old Paul Masson wine commercials where no wine before it's time. Orson Welles used to say that. Yeah, we don't want anybody in there having that sweet nectar before it's time. Okay, so petals, usually brightly colored. Um, this is the pistil, the female part. It's got some parts to it, which are on the next slide. I think I'll go over them right now. This top part up here, which is kind of hidden under my little bar. I think you see that on your, I'm sharing screen. I think you see everything's on my screen, hopefully. <laughs> this is the uh, stigma. And every time I, hey, there we go. Right here, this top part up here, that's sticky at the top, okay? Uh, to attract pollen, to stick to it. Or not so much attract it, but just if it comes in a close vicinity, it's gonna stick to it. If an insect happens to brush past this as it's flying in or crawling in, uh, it's gonna pull like Velcro in a sense, the pollen off the hairs of that insect's legs or its wings, wherever it might be attached, okay? Stigma, this tall part here looks like the stem of a vase. This whole thing looks kind of like a flower vase. Interesting that we put flowers in a vase shaped like their female reproductive parts, huh? 
Okay, it's called this style. Style, S-T-Y-L-E, like style of clothing, style. It's the style. Okay, and then our bottom part here is um, the ovary. Okay, the base of the vase is the ovary. And there's a cutaway here on this model that shows you the inside where you see the ovules. A flower can have one or more of these. And here we've got, well, here's a row of four here, a row of four here. I would assume there's probably a row of four behind us going the other direction. And there would have been a row of four coming out toward us here. Okay, uh, um, since that's cut away. But lots, you can have lots of seeds or a few seeds, plant dependent. The stamen here is made up of two parts. Okay, we have the filament, the stalk, um, kind of a filament like a wire. This filament's a wire, another word, term for wire. So this is a, a very thin uh, tubing of cells, tissues, stalk that uh, holds up the anther. And the anther. This is cut open here. You can't hardly see it. You see these little black or brown spots in each one. That's the pollen sac, and that's where the pollen grains are going to be in each one of those pollen sacs. And the pollen contains the sperm. So here's the egg. The ovule is another term for egg. Here's the egg. Here's the sperm. <clears throat> I will come back to this model, I believe, before we're done. Here's all the female parts I just went over. OK, stigma style ovary. Um, yeah, I won't talk about that. Don't worry about that. So I've already mentioned flowers attract pollinators. And yeah, pretty much already talked about this too. Well, the, the bee comes in to collect the nectar and, uh, and pollen for its food. It's also bringing in pollen from the next flower, the, the last flower it visited. So again, like I said, that can stick to that stigma. And so when that happens, we have we have uh, what's called double fertilization in plants. Okay, so I'm going to go back to my picture and talk about this. So the stigma up here, the pollen sticks to it. Okay, and what it's going to do is it's going to grow a pollen tube down into the neck of this vase. Okay, down through the style into the ovary. And it's going to release the sperm down that tube to where they can unite with the ovules, the eggs, and form a zygote, form the seed, the developing seed for the next generation. For every seed, though, that that happens to, each, each of these ovules is going to experience what's called double fertilization. One sperm is going to come down and unite with the nucleus in that ovule and make it from haploid, make it diploid, OK? The two halves, two haploid egg and sperm combined to form a diploid zygote, which will develop into the seed. But when you did your meiosis labs, you should have talked about and we'll talk about it again in, genet in genetics, I think, real quick. But when you get done with meiosis, you have four nuclei. OK, you start with one cell. It divides twice to get you basically four cells that are haploid. In males, sperm production, all four of those cells are viable for producing new offspring. OK, they're, they're all viable sperm cells. In females, though, only one of those nuclei is going to unite with an egg. The other three, oh, your notes say something silly, like they just, they disappear, they disintegrate, they something or another, I don't know, anyway. Uh, that's what uh, previous textbooks said, and it was like, I think they just didn't want to get into the explanation, but I'm going to get into the explanation. A, a, another sperm coming down that pollen tube will unite with two of those three remaining nuclei, which are referred to as polar bodies. Those three nuclei are called polar bodies. Hopefully the lab, you've, you've had that in the lab. So two of those are going to join with a second sperm. And that is going to form what's called the endosperm of the seed. And that's most of the seed. And that's 
the starchy part of the seed. That's the food storage area of the seed. And those of you who have watched your seeds germinate in your semester long uh, plant lab, you know, the, the plant project, um, everybody had to do a plant from a seed and one from vegetative propagation. <clears throat> And it was a seed you extracted out of some produce you bought at the grocery store. So if you sprouted those seeds in a paper towel baggie uh, or you wound up pulling them out of the soil for whatever reason and you saw, you may have noticed the first thing to come out of the seed is not the stem, which is what we kind of intuitively think should happen. It's the root. The root is the first thing to come out of that seed. And it grows and it grows pretty long, some of you have noticed, okay, before you see any type of stem come out. Where does all that energy for all that growth come from? Well, it has to come from the starch stored in the seed. And so that's why it's critical that these seeds have this endosperm. It's triploid, tri, triploidy. So you've got a haploid nucleus from <clears throat> that second sperm. You've got a haploid nucleus from one of the polar bodies and another haploid nucleus from the second polar body to make three haploid nuclei. So now we have three ploidy, okay, of the of the endosperm of the seed. Okay, so another way in which plants are just more complex, the reproductive system is is multi-parted, okay, different, quite different from animals. Okay, so that's what I just said, put into words for you. Um, yeah, megaspore, mega gametophyte, I, that's, that's the egg. Those are terms for the ovule, which is the egg basically. Um, here's our important fact here, okay. Unlike gymnosperms, our seeds are covered by fruits derived from the ovary and the surrounding structures. Okay, let's look at our diagram. This is the ovary. The fruit always contains a seed inside. So this whole thing here is going to become the fruit. It's going to start as soon as fertilization occurs. The rest of the flower usually dies pretty quick. If you've observed fruit trees, you've seen this happen. And then this starts to grow and swell. Okay. And this little end part out here, if you ever look at an apple, you'll, you'll see that there's like four little almost dried up leaf looking things on the end of it. Yeah, that's, that's from here. And then the stem develops on this end here, okay, it's kind of actually it's from the, the petiole usually <clears throat> of the flower. Okay, so uh, this is this is what you eat, and I've had some students when I'm giving this live lecture, and they I can see their faces, and that they the realization dawns on them. They're kind of like, oh, you mean you're you're telling me I'm eating the reproductive part? I'm eating the ovary of a plant when I eat a fruit. Yeah, you are, okay? Uh, and, and the plant wants us to, so to speak, because if we as animals pick this and eat it and then discard the seeds somewhere else, which we typically do carry it away, uh, even a wild animal will eat the fruit usually, sometimes often seeds and all, they're going to then deposit those seeds somewhere else, maybe a mile or two or three or more away, depending on how what kind of animal and how far they roam in their territories. If they're going to deposit those seeds in a nice little packet of fertilizer even, ready to go, not anywhere near the parent tree to compete with water or nutrients in the soil. So it is designed to entice, the flower is designed to entice animals to come and pollinate it, insects or animals. It's designed to grow into a fruit that's nice and sweet and will entice animals to come and eat that and carry the seeds somewhere else. Pretty nifty how they make us do all their work for a minute. Animals don't have to be the only thing. Some are designed to have wind came away like maple leaves. Maple leaves are the 
helicopter seeds. You probably played with those as a kid, maybe. Uh, that works. Gravity, of course, the fruit will fall from the tree. If the tree is anywhere on a hill or a slope, it's going to roll. Most fruit is kind of roundish, so it'll roll. Uh, and water, uh, some, some fruit are designed, uh, seed carrying structures <laughs> are designed to float in water. So trees that grow around water, their uh, seed pods are usually something that will float so they can float downstream and find another area to live. Uh, and uh, so there's all sorts of different seed types and shapes. So we have like milkweed pods, that's designed to catch the wind. Peas and beans, tomatoes, orange, oranges, watermelons. Right, look, wait, wait, these aren't fruit, these are vegetables. Ah, <laughs> here's a little botany secret. You need to know this, this will be a test question. I will give you some multiple choice options and I will ask you to pick <clears throat> the one that is not a fruit, I think. I may, I may ask you to pick the one that is a fruit and how much ones I give you. So here's the deal, if you eat it, and you are picking seeds out of it. Traditionally, we're not talking about anything that we've developed seedless, but if you eat it and you pick the seeds out of it, you're eating a fruit. So peas are the fruit, you're eating the seeds themselves. Beans are eating the seeds themselves. Tomatoes, they've got little seeds inside of them, even if they are reduced and, and not viable anymore because we've genetically messed with them. Uh, watermelons, usually I've got seedless now, but those are, <laughs> Cucumbers for pickles, squash, uh, it goes on and on. Corn is a grain, that's the seed you're eating it. It is a fruit technically, okay? Grains are a special category of fruit. There's all sorts of different types of fruit. Nuts are a fruit, okay, technically. They don't have a, um, you know, soft, fleshy covering much it's very thin <clears throat> so there's all sorts of different classifications on fruits and when you really get into it it's uh they, they talk about ratio of the fleshy part to the seed and the thickness of it and all that determines what kind of fruit it is and how many seeds it has and how many compartments it goes into like berries are considered droops well the berries are berries and then there's a droop but a lot of things we call berries are actually droops uh yeah it's uh, really interesting to look at the distinctions of that sort of thing if you want to get into that. So you say, well, what in the garden is a vegetable then? You've just pretty much named everything that's in the garden. Not really. Okay. How you know if you eat a vegetable or if you're eating a vegetable? <clears throat> Are you eating the plant itself? Not the seed, not the fruit, not the reproductive structure. But if you're eating a root or a stem or a leaf, then you're eating a vegetable. So potatoes are a tuber, which is a modified stem. Carrots are a root, beet is a root, turnip is a root, radish is a root, you get the idea, root, root crops. Uh, spinach, lettuce, broccoli, cauliflower. Well, broccoli and cauliflower could be questionable, but spinach, lettuce, no, you're eating the leaves there, okay? So those are all definitely vegetables. Broccoli and cauliflower, well, you're not eating the fruit. What you're eating there is you're eating the, the, the flowers. Those are flowers, broccoli, that's that those heads are flowers. If you leave them and you don't harvest them when, when you normally do, they will bloom into little flowers and that will produce a seed. So you are eating the reproductive structure there, but you're eating it pre-seed, okay? You're eating it before it, it becomes a flower and can even have the chance of developing a seed. So yeah, that one's kind of a gray area as to what you're eating, vegetable or, or fruit. <laughs> I would say the fruit really hasn't developed yet. It doesn't develop until fertilization occurs. So probably still technically a vegetable, um, which that means that people who eat flowers, you know, by that category of flower, like people, uh, roses. Roses are really spicy uh, condiment. They're peppery, they're hot. Uh, they're kind of surprising. Uh, it's, it's, they're interesting to put on salads and things. Um, different types of roses will have different degrees of spiciness too. Um, but people eat, uh, those. You eat violets, I think, and there's all sorts of different marigolds. If you're not allergic to the marigold, the calendula, you can eat that. Um, some people are allergic to that, so you got to be careful. Um, just, there's lots of different flowers. You can actually eat the petals, the flowers, the flower head, the whole thing. So that's, the, again, kind of said a gray area, but probably since the seed fertilization has occurred, seed hasn't formed yet, you're not quite eating your fruit. So anyway, I won't be putting any gray areas on the test, okay? <laughs> It'll be obvious to you that it's a root, a stem, or a leaf. 
and uh, and not a seed containing part or something that would become a seed containing part okay that then ends our plant presentations